anything. It's nice to see all of you here again. Thank you for coming. It's a beautiful day outside. I wish I could have been outside playing, but I was inside. My duty is to work all day. Hello, my name is Billy Sego, and I'm the director here of the Deaf Youth Drama Program. Welcome to our 24th and final, unfortunately, last Deaf Youth Drama Program play. <laughs> At Seattle Terms Theater, <laughs> I was wondering, gosh, I, most of the time I don't wear my hearing aid. I take my hearing off and I just sign up. But tonight I decided to put my hearing aid on. I'm like, why am I so quiet? It's not working. <laughs> Let's get my hands working. Okay, all right. Before I go on, one of our board members for the Seattle Children's Theater, who has also been working on our education committee, had asked me to take some time and make a few announcements. So it's my pleasure, before we proceed, to invite and please welcome Jane Hummer from Seattle Children's Theater the Board of Trustees. Now I forgot I need to have an interpreter. Oh, oh well, there we go. Ready to go. I should say an old friend and a former worker here at Deaf Youth Drama Program staff, Jeff Williamson. Wait, Jeff, come over here. Many of these 
moving to SPU, is that right? Seattle University, ah, Seattle University, and a new position there as well. So I want to congratulate you in your future endeavors, and thank you for your work here at Seattle Children's Theater and the Deaf Youth Drama Program. Thank you. I also want to thank Linda Hartzell. Is she here? Linda? There you are. Now, I know that Linda hated <coughs> to be in the spotlight, in the public eye, but I still want to recognize you because she has done so much work. If there was no Linda, there would be no DYDP. Linda always wanted something in the deaf community for so many years. And myself and Howie, we knew her through our work as actors. We stayed in contact with her, and in 1993, we were able to get a grant. And I approached Linda, and she said, yes, we can do this. So we collected some ideas, figured out how we can do this, both Howie and I, and she wrote a grant, and she made it happen. <laughs> and DYDP was born. And throughout the years, we've gone through our ups, and our downs, and sideways, and roller coaster rides in life. And Linda has been with us the whole way through. She's always said, you can do it, you can do it, stick it through, work harder. Okay, I'm working harder. And I just want to recognize her, for her commitment, and her support, and her love. So much love for our program. And our relationship has made me feel truly blessed to have the relationship with her, and I look forward to continuing in the professional and personal relationship with Linda. Many, many thanks to you, Linda, for your support and your love. Thank you. I also want to thank Howie Segoe, who was not able to be here this evening. I asked Howie to be here, but he said he had some other commitments. But I still want to recognize Howie Segoe, who is my brother, the both of us worked together to set this program up. And two years later, he had to resign and pursue some other endeavors in his professional life. But even though Howie was not a part of the whole project, we still want to recognize him from the very beginning. So thank you, Howie. And I try, I'm trying to make this as short as, I'm trying to make this as, short as possible. I want to thank all the people who have been a part of this program. I want to say thank you to Matthew Miller, who was one of the beginning. Matthew, are you here? No. Well, he was a former coordinator, office coordinator. And I want to say thank you to Jeff Williamson. You just met him. He was the interpreter on the stage. Thank you, Jeff. And I want to thank Lisa McIntosh. Lisa? Oh, she left already. Uh -huh. Well, thank you to Lisa. And I want to thank to our former teacher, Don Storinoff, who is not here this evening. But we want to thank her for her work and her support. Thank you. And we want to thank Jacob Fisher. There's Jacob. And Jacob was one of the most successful storytellers. He has a great story. Ever since he was a child, I taught him. He's one of the first children, one of our success stories. And so I was teaching him, and I hired him to join our program. And he went to Gallaudet University, did some projects there, came back here, did some projects here, went back to Gallaudet, came back to here. And I'm just happy to see Jacob, because he has become so successful and doing a great job. He will now be going back to Gallaudet University. They've offered him a position to be a stage manager in the fall, so we're excited for Jacob. Thank you. And I want to thank Ryan Schlepp. Schlepp? Ryan? Ryan! Oh, there you go. Ryan was also a former student at Tidy High School. 
His senior year, he was a part of our, one of our plays. He did a great job. He went to NTID, RIT, Rochester, New York, and then he got involved with Deaf Northwest, and he did some shows, Deaf West Theater, and did some Broadway shows. And then he came back here and started working for us, and his heart is in theater. So we're happy to have him be a part of TYDP. Thank you. Thank you all for the wonderful year, wonderful years. I want to thank Janie Bartlett, our current and last office manager. And she's in the back with the camera. There she is. Hi, thank you. She has done an incredible job. I've enjoyed working with you. And I look forward to working with you in the future. And of course, I want to thank all of the teachers here and those who are not present throughout all the years, I want to thank all of the teachers and the teacher's aides and all the volunteers who have worked tonight and all the past nights to give their time, their hours, their energy, their sweat, their patience as we work with all the students. I want to thank all of you. I think that's it. What do you think? That's enough thank yous? I'm probably missing someone. Don't feel offended. I'm sorry now. I can't remember all of you. But let's go on with the show. So now I'd like to introduce five schools who will be performing here this evening. The first is Chinook Middle School. Chinook, where are you? Yes. I want to thank Tops. It's an elementary school here in Seattle. I want to thank Eckstein Middle School, Yay. Roosevelt High School, and Madrona Elementary School in Edmond. And there are a few house rules before we can go on with the show. There are we're not allowed to take any videotaping, no camera shots. Someone just in the front row did it. Okay, I'll permit that one. But during the show, please do not take any pictures or videotaping. No flash is permitted. No flash or pictures with or without flash. Jamie is the only one who's allowed to videotape the performance. If you would like to, you can buy a performance. You already have the order pack in your brochure, and you can buy a copy of the DVD. It's very important that you fill out the form and you give it to her this evening if possible because this will be the last of this show tonight and then we will close the program in two weeks and we need to finish up by the end of June all of our business and I'm leaving. No more paperwork. So turn in your paperwork this evening, give the forms to Jamie, check, whatever, cash. After the show we will have a table right outside the door in the lobby. And you'll see kind of like balloons, it's a part of the sign, and that's where you can make your purchase. We will also be selling um, many of our old videotapes and DVDs from past performances, past celebrations, and if you thought, oh, maybe I was in that one, or oh, I saw that child, I want to be a part of that, please purchase them. We have them, and we may have the year that you're looking for. And we really want to sell all of them. So after the show. After the show, please stay seated until all of our actors and actresses have left to their rooms to pick up their items, and then you can go into the lobby. We don't want to have it too crowded. We want our actors and actresses to be able to leave first. If you have a baby who continues to cry, please use the baby crying room, which is in the top uh, room behind here. They have a soundproof room. And that way you can still see the performance and sign, but please respect others. If you have a baby who's crying, please use the quiet room. Bathrooms. Bathrooms, you go out, both right and left doors. You can go to the bathroom. Please do not come down to the front to go out to the left. That blocks visual. People will be distracted during performance. Go out the back door. Parents, if you have a child that's in the show, once the show is finished, you can't grab your child just yet. 
let them get back to their classroom, grab their items, their food, whatever they may have brought, and make sure they check in with the teacher to let them know I am now leaving so we can check them off the list and then you can take your child home. We just want to make sure that we keep a secure environment for all of our students.
Now, Jarvia, you know our dog is just fine. The other day, we were out hunting in the forest, and Dog had the scent of a fat rabbit, so I let him go. See, I, I told you the dog was great. I, I, told, I told you the dog was good. Good? I found him asleep not 20 feet later, and that rabbit was nowhere to be found. The dog is old. I think I will just take him into the forest and let him go. Hey, hey, are you hungry? Let's go eat some breakfast. What are you doing here? It's so good to see you. Oh, I ran away from the farm. Jarvis didn't want me anymore because I'm so old and cannot run as fast as I once could. Oh, the same happened to me. I am going to town to become a musician. Would you like to come with me? You can bark, woof, woof, and I will be mad. You can make some food. Come.
and Hilda were going to make me into chicken soup. Don't. But we are running too. You have to join our band. You can become a musician too. You can crawl. And I will be. And dog will burp, burp, burp. And they will meow. You can go. How about it? Let's go.
act so fast. First, we should be sure that all of those monsters are gone. Don't uh, look at me. Why me? I always get the dirty work. Okay, okay. I'll go ahead and I'll look around. If everything seems fine, then I will wave to you. And when you see me wave, you all can come in. Good luck. And we'll be careful. scientist. 
But you died in 1931. Oh, so you did learn something about me in school. I didn't do very well in school. The teacher always, the teachers always thought I was a little uh, feeble-minded. But I did use Morse code to ask my wife to marry me. Oh, I didn't know you were deaf. Yeah, uh, I became deaf as a result of illness, but um, for me it was more uh, of uh, an insulation from chit-chat instead of isolation. There's got to be a remote around here, or a hologram, or something. This must be a trick. Hey, watch where you're going. You almost knocked me over, and you might wake up the dog. On a full moon around here, you never know what's going to happen. Jesse, this is Robert White Graff. Robert worked with James Marsters and Andrew Sachs to invent the TTY. Yeah, it's right up here. Do you want to use it? You know, the first TTYs were heavy. This one from 1966 weighed 76 pounds. It was torture on the arms. Wow, all that work must have made you rich. No, after struggling with the AT&T, we decided to invest our own money. We mm -hmm. set up a deaf-owned company. At that time, there was no email, no instant messaging, no video conferencing. What did we have? Just the telephone. If you wanted to invite your friends to a party, you had to go to their house. If they weren't home, you left a note on their door. Then when your friends came back and saw the note, they had to go to your house. And if you weren't home, they had to leave a note on your door. Why, if you had to call 911, you had to find a hearing neighbor to call for you. Well, so I'd have to find a neighbor if I was having a heart attack? So, Jesse, does this give you a little appreciation for history? <laughs> Interesting technology. Would have uh, made doing business in my time easier, having a TTY. Uh, Robert, do you still have your original drawings? I'd like to see how you developed your ideas. Oh, sure. Uh, right over here. Boy, is my mom mad. She is going to come pick me up, and luckily she hadn't called the police yet. Well, while you're waiting, do you want to um, go to the observatory? The stars are gorgeous here. Ooh, yeah, wow, I've never seen those stars before. Hello. Ah. So you've never been to the hem Southern Hemisphere before? Oh, I am sorry to have startled you. Those stars name, those are the Magellanic Clouds. Lovely, aren't they? Uh, Southern Hemisphere? How did I get to the Southern Hemisphere? How did I get to the Southern Hemisphere from the museum? Well, museums can take you to some amazing places. Is that sound you're going to start signing to me, too? I will if you ask me politely. Jesse, let me introduce you to Henrietta Swan Levitt and Annie Jump Cannon. They're both acclaimed astronomers. Why, thank you, Harry. Those stars aren't the Milky Way, but they're a neighboring galaxy. A deaf astronomer by the name of John Goodrick discovered variable stars back in 1784. Then in 1912, I published my findings about the remarkable relationship about the um, brightness of the light and the period of the stars. What she means 
Let me see. Um, oh, I, I, I forgot exactly how to explain that. What she means is that the star's brightness help you figure out the measurements for other stars in the universe. Constantine! Be careful with that rocket, you're going to put somebody's eye out. But how can I learn new things if I don't experiment? In my time, space travel was only an idea. Now, people travel to the moon. Oh, who are you? Uh, hi there, I'm Jesse. You must be the famous Konstantin Tsiolovsky, the famous scientist. Ah, I can see my reputation precedes me. Yeah, well, I remember reading something about you. Uh, I, I, that you're deaf, perhaps? Yes, I became deaf as a child as a result of scarlet fever. But while I was recovering, I was so bored that I read my brother's physics and math books. And, oh, I was trying to remember something else I read about you. Didn't the king tell you to shut up? Well, yes. Uh, I used to get so excited with experimentation and stuff, I, I would put bugs in little boxes and fly them on a kite. Well, there we go with math again. Yes, well the Tsar thought that my experiments would uh, start people thinking about freedom. <coughs> yeah, yeah, the International Space Station that we read about uh, was taking some pictures of Earth for us. Oh, to look at Earth from that perspective. Must be very nice. And I like the sound of international. Uh, who's, that, who's that man behind the uh, flag over there hiding around? That's Erastus Smith. He was a scout for a general during the war between America and Mexico. I didn't know that the U.S. and Mexico had ever fought a war. Yes, uh... I saw a bunch of people, I saw some movement around, so I decided to come do some reconnaissance, uh... And, you know, remember the Alamo, all that? Uh, I was sent back to the Alamo to search for survivors after that. What'd you do? Fall asleep in history class? Sometimes. <laughs> Erastus, I thought you were over in the history building. Yeah, but like I said, I saw y'all moving around and wanted to come see what was going on. Didn't you blow up a bridge or something? destroyed the San Jacinto Bridge. It was an important victory in the war. For the Americans. Ah, oh, here comes someone else from the history wing. Were you in the Battle of San Jacinto too? No, later on, 1849, I took a ship to California. Hmm, <clears throat> 1849, California. Oh, the gold rush! That's exactly right. I was searching for gold. Oh, did you find any? Yep, enough to buy myself a farm. Yes, and then in 1880, Edmund Booth was nominated for the National Association of the Deaf Presidency, but he declined. Oh. Good evening, everybody. 
quite an impressive group for the uh, Deaf Mosaic segment. Oh, and a member of the younger generation. Nice to meet you, young man. I'm Gilbert Eastman, known as Gil. Oh, I've seen your show. What a great job. Yes, Gil was one of the founders of the National Theater of the Deaf. Yes, and I hope you get to see a lot of plays. Maybe in uh, your near future you'll be on stage. <laughs> well, I don't know, I always thought working at a fast food joint would be better. Deaf people didn't just make history in the past, they're making history today. So you need to find something yourself that you love and shake up the world with that. And Shannon Graham, right now, she has gone to the Arctic Pole and she has studied how climate change affects the ice pack. And Keith Watt, he worked for NASA. He studied Mars. And now he's become a writer. Wow! <coughs> and Michelle Cook. She studies earthquakes at the University of Massachusetts. Sounds a lot better than flipping burgers to me, Jesse. And it looks like your mom's here. Well, I better not keep her waiting. Thank you all so much. Well, see you later. Bye. Well, the night watchman's back. Back is er is back early. Everybody, back in their places. Come on. Good evening, Doctor Lang. Kind of boring around here, yeah. Oh, it's never boring for me around here. There's so many stories here. Well, I've checked all the doors and windows. Everything's locked up tight. It's a beautiful night outside. Yes, good night. Can you see anything? Yes, wonderful things. What? What do you see? I see a solid wall of gold and a beautiful jeweled chest. Furniture shaped like animals. Vases and statues all glittering with gold. Finally, finally we're 
were into King Tut's tomb. It smells sweet in here, probably from King Tut's funeral. Seems like time has just melted away and the king was just buried yesterday. Now, before we get started, we need to be very careful. Everything in here is 3,300 years old. So, Arnett, I want you to put down everything as described. Will do. And you need to photograph everything that was found. Yes, sir. Allie? Help me figure out what these mean and the measurements. We want the height and the width of the room. Also, the sarcophagus needs to be measured and the stairway as well. Roger that. Wendy? Yes? Can you help me figure out what these painting means and the hieroglyphics? And we can find out more information about King Tut's past. Well, this one, that is Osiris. The king of the underworld and prince of the dead. Osiris is a famous king who was the first king to be mummified. You know, that's right. He was embalmed by Anubis. You're right, Anubis, he was a jackal-headed god of embalmers. His picture is what we see here. When Osiris died, he became a god, and he became king of the underworld. All the Egyptians wanted to go there. The ancient Egyptians had one great wish, that was to live forever. They believed that after they died, a new life would begin. Wendy, could you tell me who these are and what they represent? Certainly. Uh, let me see here. Um, this one is called the Weighing the Heart. The heart of King Tutankhamun, bearing a record of all his past deeds, is placed on the scales. Forty-two assessor gods interrogated the dead man, accusing him of various crimes which he denied. And the king, the ibis-headed god of wisdom, would put down that he is of true voice and could go through to Osiris' kingdom. What happens if the dead man is told lies? Is he punished? Well, if he finds out there was lies, the goddess, called the devourer of the dead, will eat his heart and will not survive in the afterworld. Did that happen to King Tutankhamun? Hmm. No, no, we see King Tutankhamun standing here with the ibis-headed god, Nu. And Osiris is welcoming him into the afterlife, followed by his spirit double. Carter, say, what are these jars for? Those are called Canupic jars. And inside it contains King Tut's, his lungs, his stomach, his liver, and his intestine. Why would they do that? Well, the ancient Egyptians believed that any part of the body could be used in a spell against a person so all the inner organs are removed during the mummification process. They're dried out, wrapped in linen, and placed in separate jars. Well, what happens to the brain and the heart? Well, the brain was removed through the nostril with a metal hook and probably thrown away. The heart is left in the body so that it can be weighed in the afterlife. As you can see here, the jars have stoppers, three animals and one human. This one here is named Hoppy. It is a baboon who's guarding the lungs. 
And this is the jackal-headed god, Dwimutef, who guards the stomach. This is the human one, Ibsen, who guards the liver. And this one is a falcon, Kebsenef. He guards the intestines. Oh, tell me about these paintings. She has the ability to become a bird with the breeze on her wings and was able to bring new life into the soul of the dead. This is Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis, and known as the god of the sky. And this one, she became a falcon, and with her, she could bring breeze and life. son of Osiris. And this one has a ma magic eye named the Uja. You can find the symbol everywhere. Allie, come help me lift the lid.
my friend Taz, who went to this birthday party. There were so many people there. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, cool. Rebel, 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 rebel. <laughs> what are those people doing with their hands? Oh, what are you doing? Talk with your mouth. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> wave, 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 wave. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah. siblings do not know sign language. They only speak Punjabi. I went first to an oral school, and I cried a lot. And then I transferred to a deaf and hard of hearing program at uh, View Ridge Elementary School. I wish my parents could sign. I miss a lot of uh, communication when we try to talk, and I often uh, Yeah, that's it. <laughs> My name is Ashley, and I'm hard of hearing. My hearing loss was first noticed when I was about 10 years old. Uh, My stepmom called me, but I couldn't hear her, and she seemed very far away. So we moved back to Seattle. We went to the children's hospital and found out that I did indeed have a hearing loss. And that was when I first got my glow-in-the-dark hearing aid. I grew up oral, and I started learning ASL when I was 14 years old. And I'm still learning ASL, but I'm improving. I sign and talk. My name is Hovita, and I'm hard of hearing, and I'm learning sign language for the first time. I don't have a hearing aid, but I can still hear without it and talk. My family is all hearing, and I know Spanish very well. My name is Barbara. I'm hard of hearing. My family does not know sign. I know a little bit. My family supports me. It is very proud of me, and I love them. Hi, my name is David. I'm hard of hearing. I'm a Jewish guy from New York. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a traditional Jewish family. And uh, before I, I went to the deaf and hard of hearing program, I was at a private oral uh, Hebrew school where I studied Hebrew. And, uh, but really what I really did was sit in the back and look out the window because I didn't understand what was going on and I couldn't speak the language. And no one would talk to me at school or at temple on Saturdays. 
Hi, my name is Ivan Nikolov, and I'm from Russia. Hi, my name is Juan. I'm 18 years old. I'm hard of hearing. And the way that I communicate with my family is in Spanish. Uh, but I like the deaf and hard of hearing program here at Roosevelt High School very much. I'm Kim Vu. I was born hard of hearing, and I have to wear hearing aids to have full access to communicate with hearing people. that happens all too frequently. for those with hearing aids, as it can be quite painful. And with those without hearing aids, sound goes in one ear and out the other. Another mistake is that uh, often people think that you have to enunciate in an exaggerated fashion, but that can get very messy. Those who can lip read to some degree of success are used to the normal speech patterns. Another very common misassumption is that most deaf people read lips very well. The average deaf person gets maybe 25% of the spoken contents. 
40 to 60 percent of English sounds are homophonic, which means that the formation on the lips are identical to that of the other sounds. Now we'll demonstrate. Each will, in their turn, show you a word and what it looks like on the lips without using their voices. And now, uh, can you tell the difference? <laughs> I couldn't. Um, so now let's see what they really said. I said bear. B-E-A-R. Bear. And I said pear. P-E-A-R. I said mare. M-A-R-E. I said mare. M-A-Y-O-R. See? Lip reading is not an easy job. And even the deaf who are really good at lip reading get tired after 15 or 20 minutes. Their eyes are ready to fall out. So please think about this. Class dismissed. And now I'd like to ask for a moment of silence at this sad occasion. wrong with this picture? What's wrong? 
with that picture? Well, I know. Um, the teacher should look and speak directly to the deaf student and in a normal way that will help the deaf student feel respected and included. Right on! Good job! Okay. information, it's their responsibility to ask the teacher for clarification, and they shouldn't be chatting with the interpreter during class. Right? While the interpreter's working, right? Because they're on duty. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And... The teacher should also not talk to the interpreter while the interpreter is on duty, whether or not the uh, deaf student is engaged in an activity or not. You're both right. Good job. Thank <laughs> you. 
lives, and that are called tele typewriting devices for the deaf, abbreviated as T. Oh, uh, it's abbreviated. Um, and that's how people can talk on the phone. You might be wondering how they do that. Ta-da! <laughs> In this way, deaf people can communicate with each other on the phone. And it does not require the use of voice. <laughs> and now... Uh, and now... You might be wondering, how a deaf person knows how their phone is ringing. Here's the answer. <laughs> so you see a flashing light alerts the deaf person to the fact that their phone is ringing. It might also let them know that their baby is crying. Or it may flash for any other reason. Um, yes, it's wonderful, <coughs> but what if a person doesn't have a TDD? How then would they communicate with a deaf person who does? Well, the answer again is easy. TTYs and hearing people with phones. A demonstration, please. To another example. For example, how do deaf people watch television? You know, because on television you just see all these talking heads, yada da da da, da blah, So, presenting to you, the television, inside of which is a decoder, which makes the captioning visible to people who want it. 
And that way, deaf people can read the text and follow along with the story. Okay, we're demonstration over. <laughs> Welcome to our performance. Our school is Madrona, K through eight. Our performance tonight is Elizabeth, the paper bag princess. There was a girl named Elizabeth. She was a very beautiful princess, and she lived in a very tall, towering castle with banners waving high in the sky. And a drawbridge went <laughs> <laughs> down. sharp teeth and very long wings fire breathing dragon <gasps> now this is where our story begins the dragon
midnight snack, yes.
please come up on the stage.
So we're giving him this. Pictures of all of our students. This is pictures of all the students this year at Eckstein. Oh, it's incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. And also, can you go back to the Thank you. And don't forget, Jacob Fisher also gets a photograph so that he won't forget us either. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We also have some flowers to give you. Wait a minute. Hang on. There's more. Okay. Here's the rest. These are for you. Thank you. Do you mind holding these so that I can make my last comments? <laughs> oh, he's ready to move on. Get out of the way. Okay, are we, are we seriously done? Uh, uh, okay. Now, as we close, I remember the very first festival. We were so small, and we started a small tradition of always bringing our children. So I brought my daughter Ruby when she was born, first born. Look, her first festival! And then she grew and grew. And she kept coming to every festival and she would always stand next to me at the opening of the show. And then my son was born, Tucker. And I would hold Tucker in my arms. And I remember one time I was holding him and he burped. And he was messy. You remember that? I don't know if you remember that. But now I think I would like to continue that tradition as I wrap up. So may I ask my children to come up here, please? so proud of my children. They are my rock, my foundation. They've been through all the good and the bad times, the ups and the downs. My life would be empty if I had no children. So I want to thank both of you for your incredible patience as I work long hours all over the place and they're still here for me, always wanting me. And I have so many goals and aspirations for all of you. And thank you for being here with my last and final festival of the DYDP for being here with me tonight. And I love you both so much. Would you like to say good night and thank you for coming and drive carefully? Good night. Thank you for coming. And safe drive. Have a nice, safe drive.